my history starts with working in large organizations after working at a startup where uh, in 2000 I was continuously deploying to production by FTPing files from my workstation directly into production. And then I joined an, an enterprise and discovered that you can't do that anymore. Uh, and I discovered actually that the situation is, 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 is pretty difficult. Um, I worked on a team whose job it was to turn deployment from a process that took a whole weekend to a process that could be completed in an hour. Uh, and we pioneered the idea of zero downtime deployments back in 2005, working for a large telco. And subsequent to that, I discovered that the situation there was, in fact, not abnormal, but very common. And what I saw time and time again was that organizations would try and adopt Agile. Everyone would be sent on the two-day Scrum course, and at the end of that, Employees were taking orders standing up instead of sitting down, and that huge backlog of work that you can't ever complete is now prioritized and estimated, and now we're somehow agile. But the reality of these organizations is that uh, what you've actually created is not agile, but what I call water scrum fall. So you have scrum, but it's embedded within a process that still takes a very long time to go from end to end. You have the study and design and planning and budgeting process at the beginning that may take weeks or months to go through to get a business case for a project. And then you might be doing Agile in these nice iterations, uh, working in very short iterations and doing testing and analysis in line. But then to actually get anything delivered to users, you have to go through this process of integration and testing. Uh, and then if you're lucky, you manage to fix some of the critical bugs. And then the whole thing gets tossed over the wall to IT operations to run. And the problem with this is that it doesn't change the outcomes. The cycle time going from uh, an idea to a measurable customer outcome doesn't change a great deal when you change this middle part of the sandwich because most of the time is often taken up at the front end uh, or in the last mile. Uh, this might give you, you know, 5 to 10% increase in uh, efficiency in terms of reduced time to market and reduced cost, but it's not going to produce anything order of magnitude. And unfortunately, this is the reality of Agile for many organizations today. And so I and, and many, other, many others of us in the industry asked ourselves, can we do better? And the answer is yes, we can do better. Uh, I was blown away. I go to Velocity every year uh, to, to see what the state of the art is among the kind of uh, software companies, the new com software companies. This slide blew me away. This is from 2011. This is Amazon's production environment. Uh, deployments to their production environment. They're deploying to their production environment every 11.6 seconds, making up to 1,079 deployments in an hour. On average, 10,000 of those boxes are receiving a deployment, up to 30,000 boxes, and that was 2011. I visited them uh, end of last year, and they're seeing about an order of magnitude improvement in those statistics. Uh, and I'll talk a bit later about how they achieved that, because they certainly <laughs> were not able to achieve that in their early days. Why do they do this? This is very expensive for them to do. They invested a great deal of money and resources in achieving this outcome. The reason they do it is to avoid building things that don't matter. So I spoke to Ronnie Kahavi, who uh, pioneered Amazon's A-B testing framework and then went on to Microsoft uh, and built Microsoft's experimentation platform uh, and does the A-B testing framework for Bing. And he has a ton of data from A-B tests. And his data tells him that evaluating what are thought to be good ideas, two-thirds of those good ideas either deliver zero or negative value to the organization when they go into production. This is the biggest source of waste in our industry, is the features we build that deliver zero or negative value. And those damage us severely in, in three ways. Firstly, you know, you've wasted the time building it, so there's an opportunity cost for something you could have built instead. Secondly, those features live forever, and you've got to pay the maintenance costs and maintaining them in production forever. And then third, that adds a drag on your ability to add new functionality. The more complexity you have in production, the slower the rate at which you can add new things to production, as I'm sure you're all painfully aware. So their ability to put experiments into production, gather real data from users, discover the impact on the metrics they care about, customer lifetime revenue uh, or whatever, is key to their ability to move fast by avoiding doing work on things that don't matter. And it's impossible to know in advance. These are just for small features. If you're building a new product, the level of uncertainty is correspondingly an order of magnitude higher. So you need to be even more careful not to build things that, that don't add value. And our processes for budgeting 
uh, and planning are very poor at predicting the value that will be delivered by the projects because those numbers are, are very hard to find. So, one of the things I've been doing the last couple of years is studying the DevOps movement. So I work with Gene Kim, author of the Phoenix Project, uh, Chef's biggest competitor, Puppet Labs, uh, and uh, statistician called Nicole Forsgren, who's a professor at Utah State University, to study the DevOps movement. And we did a survey of uh, over 8,000 people worldwide, IT professionals working in a number of different domains. And one result we found was very, very interesting and groundbreaking, which is that IT is a competitive advantage. So for those of you who've you know, followed Nicholas Carr's work, IT doesn't matter, that's not in fact true. What we found is we used a standardized metric to measure profitability, market share, and productivity, which are the three key organizational metrics um, that, that we care about. And what we found is that firms with high-performing IT organizations were twice as likely to exceed their goals on these organizational performance metrics. So IT does matter. The second thing that we were able to do is find a statistically valid way to measure IT performance. And there's four metrics that we discovered fed into this key metric. One is lead time for changes. The second is release frequency. And these together measure throughput, how fast can we react to business changes? And then the last two metrics are stability metrics. When there's an outage or a service degradation, how rapidly can we restore service? And then what's our change fail rate? When we push a change out to production, what proportion of the time do we have to roll back or uh, remediate that change? And what we found is that this is not a zero-sum game. The high performers were able to achieve much higher levels of throughput and higher levels of stability as well. The common thinking is if you increase throughput, you reduce stability. This is not the case. High performers do better at both of them. And the other good news is that even enterprises are able to achieve high levels of IT performance. 20% of the largest companies, over 2,000 uh, people in the IT department, were achieving uh, were in the high performing group. So it's absolutely not impossible. What we actually found was there was a bulge. So the number of people in the high performance group is great at the small end, and then it's much smaller in the middle, and then at the top end, you actually get some improvement. But it's absolutely possible for large companies to achieve high levels of performance. These are the things that correlate with high IT performance. The first thing is being able to reproduce your production environment purely from information in version control and database backups. And what we found interestingly was that it was more important to have your system configuration and your application configuration in version control than it was to have your code in version control in terms of achieving high performance. Developers and the business getting failure alerts and information from production, monitoring, and logging was very important rather than, say, Twitter. Develop, uh, these kinds of surveys are a, a very powerful source of confirmation bias, which is why I love them. Uh, I've been instrumental in helping develop continuous delivery and continuous uh, integration. And so I wanted to find out if developers working off trunk, merging their code into trunk daily and breaking up large features into small incremental changes actually works. And the data shows that overwhelmingly it does. It leads to much higher levels of performance, both throughput and stability. So trunk-based development, continuous integration, uh, automated testing provides a business payoff. And then this is the DevOps question when Dev and Ops interact is the outcome win-win. So using some statistical magic, uh, Nicole was able to find out which factors predicted high performance. And these are very interesting. Peer-reviewed change approval process. So if you work in an organization where a separate team has to approve changes before they can go into production, that massively reduces throughput, as you would expect. But the really shocking news is that that does nothing to improve stability. Having an external change approval board reduces throughput by over an order of magnitude and does nothing to increase stability. And what we found, what the data clearly shows, is that peer review, so pair programming or developers reviewing each other's changes using code review, produces much higher levels of throughput and the same levels of stability in production. And this, you know, all these metrics, we, we kind of measured them as performance goes down in, high, in, in large companies. This was the one where the line just clearly goes bew like that as you, as you move to low performance in large companies. Version controlling everything we've talked about, proactive monitoring, high trust organizational culture. I don't have time to talk about that this morning, but one of the most interesting results from my perspective was a way to measure and model 
organizational culture. Uh, and uh, Bashir's slides at the beginning talked about the importance of culture. Uh, the survey actually has um, a model of culture that comes from social sciences, which we proved is very important in achieving high IT performance. Uh, the biggest connection, actually, with organizational performance of the things we measured was employee satisfaction, measured in terms of, do I have the tools to do my job? Would I recommend this organization as a good place to work? We asked four questions on job satisfaction, and those were the biggest predictor of organizational performance. Organizational culture was the biggest predictor of job satisfaction. So that turns out to be extremely important. Mm -hmm.